This question is really just asking about accuracy and precision. When it comes to accuracy and precision, for accuracy, think average. And for precision, think range. So if you were to get on a scale, let's suppose you weigh 150 pounds, and you know you weigh 150 pounds, and you were to get on a scale that's like crappy and broken, and it says you weigh 202 pounds. You step off and you get back on, and the next measurement says you weigh 203 pounds. You get off again, you get on, it says you weigh 201 pounds, and then it says you weigh 202 pounds again, and you get on again, and it says you weigh 202 pounds again. You know you don't weigh this much, but the scale says you do. These, these five measurements are a great example of how the scale is precise, but it's not accurate. The actual value of your weight wouldn't be these values or anything close to it if you weigh 150 pounds, but the scale, instruments can be broken or miscalibrated, um, and people can make measurements that are also incorrect. So whenever the values are close together, but they're not necessarily right, it's considered to be precise. These values are wrong, they're not accurate, but they have a very tight range. So you can think of range and precision also related to consistency. This scale, it's consistent. It's consistently wrong, but it's consistent. So thinking, keeping that in mind, we can go through and label which ones of these are precise because they have tight ranges. This one is precise, so is the other one. I would say it has high precision and high precision because they have very tight ranges of data. If you look at the max and min values, they have high precision relative to the others. These would be considered low precision because they have pretty large ranges of high and low values. They have wide ranges. Accuracy relates to average. So if this central line here is the baseline, that is the true value. And it does say that the actual mass of the water is 25 grams, so that is gonna be here. And there are people trying to measure it. Looking at the first one, the first one, if you look at the average, you can eyeball it and see that this is actually pretty high, high accuracy. So the first one is highly accurate and highly precise. The second one is highly precise. The second student is highly precise because the range of their values is small, but the average of their values is just way off. So this is low accuracy. Um, the, it's a little bit harder to see for these, but it's possible. If you look at the approximate average for student three, although they have pretty low precision because their range, their values are all over the place, they happen to have high accuracy because the average of their values is near the actual value. Unfortunately for student four, not only is their range relatively large, but the average of their values is far away as well. So they have low accuracy. So that's how you see. So if you look at like these questions, it says which student has high precision. So let's get high precision. That means that their range is tight, but low accuracy. That would be student number two. This is sig figs. Sometimes those are at this point in chemistry, and especially going forward, that's like a mental break because it's so much simpler in, in many ways. Um, this question says, how many zeros in this number are significant? So quick review of the rules. So we have 0, 0, 5, 0, 8, 4, 0. So zeros seem a little tricky because they just have so many issues, it seems. But it's really not that bad. Never do tr uh, leading zeros, which are zeros before something, matter. So zeros in the front, they are not significant. So of these five zeros, we automatically know that three of them are not significant. We also know that zeros between significant digits, which are not zero, they are significant. So we have one significant zero so far. Often the question is, what about that trailing zero? Does a trailing zero matter? Sometimes is the answer. When there is a decimal point, the trailing zero does matter. Look at this number. Imagine adding more zeros, and you can kind of feel that this number just gets tighter and tighter and more precise and more precise. But we have this number. The rule still applies. When there's a decimal point, 
Any zeros on the tail end are significant. So there are two significant zeros here. But here's another example. Suppose you have this number. And you're asked how many significant how many significant zeros there are. There is no decimal point shown. So these interior zeros are significant, and obviously the non-zeros are significant. But these trailing zeros are not significant because there's no decimal point. For number two, it says, what is the correct number of sig figs? And the answer for the following calculation. You are going to have to put this into your calculator. I recommend that you rewrite it stacked up with decimal points aligned. So here's what I mean by that. The, there are three numbers, which means there are going to be three decimal points in this example. So let's write the first number. It's 5.6792, and then the second one is going to be 0 0.6, and the third one is going to be 4.33. Add them all up as normal. So I'm going to do that in my calculator. 5.6792 plus 0 0.6 plus 4.33. And I get 10.6092. So 10.6092. The rules of sig figs for addition and subtraction are very, very simple. Only care about what's after the decimal point. So that's all this stuff. In terms of determining how many digits you keep in your own decimal point after it. So looking at this, there are four digits after the decimal point here. You can call them, I invented this term I believe, I call them PDDs, which are post-decimal digits. There are four PDDs here. There's only one PDD here, and there are two PDDs here. And you can only keep, your answer can only have the number of PDDs that is in the least amount of all the pieces that make it up. So if there is just one PDD in the three parts of the answer, then you can only keep one PDD and therefore you gotta cut everything else. So the answer you are going to provide is 10.6. Now overall, and this is where it gets a little tricky based on, it really just seems to vary a bit, but then you're gonna look at the entire answer and consider how many sig figs that is. And there are gonna be three in this case. There's one significant post decimal digit, but the overall number has three. This question says, if a compound has the chemical formula VClO42, what is the formula of the compound made from the same cation with the anion of oxygen? This, I think this is a fun question, but that's just me. Um, this one's interesting because you gotta know a couple of things. First, it says the same cation, which means it's gonna be the same oxidation state or charge on this vanadium. So let's write out the formula V. ClO4. These are all the actual atoms, by the way. One formula unit has a vanadium, a chlorine, and four oxygens. This two on the outside tells us that there's two packages of chlorate. So this is going to give us the real number here. So overall, there is one vanadium atom, two chlorine atoms, and eight oxygen atoms. Just keep that in mind for like in general when you're reading these formulas. All right, so you have VClO42. Let's split it apart because we have a cation. This is a vanadium cation. And then we have a polyatomic anion, which is ClO4. You do need to know your polyatomic oxy anions. Um, and this looks a lot like chlorate. Hmm, chlorate. Let's see what chlorate would be. ClO three minus, that's chlorate. Just keep in mind that when you add an oxygen to the base form, then you have to add the per prefix. So this is ClO4, this is not chlorate. This would actually be perchlorate, in case you cared. So it's ClO4 minus, that's what this is. So this would be vanadium something perchlorate. Let's write the name out because that's good practice and it might help you with this especially if you're used to doing that by now. So if we were to name this compound, it would be vanadium, 
and we come across that issue where, oh wait, mm, vanadium is in the transition metal area. So you're gonna get a little box around it. We don't know explicitly the charge. Unlike way up here, we could look at the position of lithium or the position of aluminum and know it has a plus one or plus three respectively. But vanadium is a transition metal. We can't just look at its position on the periodic table and assume it has a consistent predictable charge. So we don't know, but the, the way that we indicate the oxidation state or the charge on a transition metal is we put parentheses. But we have this mystery. We don't know what it is, so let's come back to it. But because we learned our polyatomic anions, we know that this is perchlorate. Now perchlorate and chlorate and all the other versions of chlorate and chlorite will have a minus one charge. So this is where you look at your negative charge and you do some counting. There are two chlorates, perchlorates. So since there are two perchlorates, you kind of do some counting and think, well, if there's two perchlorates and every perchlorate is minus two, there's a total amount of charge, or every perchlorate is minus one, there's a total amount of charge of minus two because two times negative is a total amount of negative two charge. Remember that this whole compound is neutral. So since this whole compound is neutral, the amount of negative charge, in this case minus two, must be balanced by the total amount of positive charge. So it has to be a total amount of positive two charge. There's only one vanadium atom, see, just one. So since there's only one vanadium atom in this formula unit, this single vanadium atom has to assume all of that plus two charge. So this is a vanadium two ion. That's important because this is the cation that you're gonna be using. It says the same cation, but now you've gotta add it in with oxygen. So let's shrink all this down. Suppose that there's a chemical reaction. You mix vanadium perchlorate, vanadium two perchlorate with something that is going to give it an oxygen. Effectively, you're seeing, well, what in the world is going to be the formula for vanadium two, that's the same cation, right? Vanadium two, same cation. That's, this is a vanadium two ion. But now it's gonna combine with oxygen, and we know that when oxygen is in an ionic compound, it's called oxide. So you're kind of connecting names and formulas here, and now you have the vanadium two ion that you had initially, but it's with oxygen now. Think back to what we talked about earlier. The vanadium two is V with a two plus. I guess I'll color code that, doesn't matter. So this is a V with a two plus, and we know that oxide is O with a two minus. How do we know it's two minus? Because you just gotta be able to look at the periodic table, practice how to read it and know where these ions come from. Oxygen is in the minus two charge family, down to that staircase thingy, which separates the, most of the metals and the non-metals. So back to here, where did it go? So we have a two plus and a two minus. Two plus and two minus are already equal and opposite. So it turns out that you just kind of stick them together. And what you get is just VO. This compound is vanadium two oxide. I want people to recognize that there is no two in the formula for this compound, but the name of the formula is called vanadium two oxide. So be very comfortable going from formula to name and from name to formula. That's gonna take practice.